Our first speaker is Jason Dietz with the FHWA Resource Center in Lakewood, Colorado, and he is going to talk about preserving our roadway networks. Jason? I'm very pleased to be here to talk a little bit about some best practices through my years of experience with Federal Highway for 23 years going around the country and working for division offices and working for our federal lands offices. I've, I've gained a lot of good experiences and, and wanted to share them. And I know there's a lot more other experiences out there, but I wanted to share some of the things that I've been a part of and want to kind of bring it out to tuition. And also some of the things that Federal Highway is doing to continue the preservation treatments, the preservation work after Mr. Sorensen has less, left us. All right, with that said, I'm a native of Montana, so those for those folks that are from Montana, hooray. Um, a little bit about the objectives, what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, establishing a, a program, very important for preservation, as well as looking at our pavement management system. What are you using for our cost effectiveness? Looking at project prioritizations with your divisions or your districts out there. How are they going about choosing their projects? And accordingly, looking at a kind of a new approach, but I know some maintenance people have used this a process for some years, looking at IDIQ contracts, as well as I'm going to talk a little bit about Everyday Counts Initiatives 4, where we'll where talk about when and where and how. And lastly, some free base training, because I know everybody's looking for getting their people, inspectors and et cetera, some training out there prior to construction. And I want to share some of the things that was talked yesterday by Butch that are some great examples, and we've got some other ones coming out here in the near future. But with that said, establishing a program. Part in 2009, I worked for five years for Eastern Federal Lands. I was charged of our pavement management system for 401 parks across the country. There was a poll taken in 2012 and that 283 million people had visited the parks in 2012. So that's a pretty significant amount of, of, of people going to the parks. Anybody been in the parks in the last year? Uh, there's a few. Well, they're a, great, they're a great place to visit, to get away from the hustle bustle world. And um, I, was, I was given the choice of going out there and establishing a payment management system for these national parks that contain about 5,500 miles, lane miles, so it's not too much. It's mostly, uh, mostly low volume roads. However, there are some high volume roads around the Washington DC, the Baltimore Parkway and things like that, that we do have an excessive amount of high vehicle traffic. But it was an opportunity to really go in and take what was adopted early on in the late 1990s of our pavement management system that we had through Stantec and developing some kind of a pavement management prioritization for our national parks. Because like you states in the different districts, you want a way to prioritize your projects, and I'm, I'm going to go in and share a little bit about that. So as Larry went around the country in the early 2000s, he did a lot of reviews on pavement preservation. I was, and I had the ability to go on a couple of those ruse, reviews in Alabama and, and Arizona to talk about their pavement preservation program. Then he asked to come out to the federal lands part and get a perspective on how pavement preservation is doing for the national parks. So he came out there, he interviewed us, and the, some of the things that he found that could be improved a little bit is about the definitions. What are the terminologies? In dealing with 401 parks across the country, you guys can all imagine what the terminology is out, out there. Uh, Chip Seal, Surrey Seal, they all know those, but a lot of them have different terminologies, and we wanted to establish a program that everybody understands what the proper terminologies are. So that was one of the first things that I did in 20, 2012. After, after that review that was done by Larry, we needed to establish a program that had definitions. So with that, we created that. We, uh, we had terms of what pavement preservation is, what those treatments are, what is rehabilitation, and what is routine maintenance. Along with that, a lot of our parks, because unfortunately they're not like a state DOT, they don't have maintenance programs, they have to have some kind of a, a manual. And a lot of your big parkways, like Nassus Trace, just a little bit south of here, Great Smokies, and some of those other ones, they have maintenance programs, but some of the other ones, as time has gone by, people are leaving, they need some kind of programs to help them move along. 
So in 2013, we created a, a pavement maintenance manual to also assist in that effort. Along with that, one of the first things I did is I took my experience in working in California and other states that every year some kind of a, a yearly report comes out on their pavement condition. So I established in, uh, in 2012 a, a report that kind of looked like this, the pavement condition report. And since then, every year, this report has been generated for our national parks to prioritize their projects and optimize their projects. With that, here's kind of a breakdown of what some of the common treatments are for preventative maintenance, light, three, light rehab, heavy rehab, and reconstruction. Some of these things may not be, as you'll see in there, there may be some preventative maintenances for some DOTs that uh, say your light rehab is more of a preventative maintenance, but some of our, some of our roadways are in the national parks are not heavily congested, so that's the reason, and working with the different parks, this is what the structure that they wanted to use. Furthermore, we also wanted to collect data, because at the times, over the last 10, 15 years, we were going through reauthorization bills, we had established some kind of cost information, and I'm not sure, Many DOTs through their pavement management systems also have to report out what their cost situations are with some of these rehab and pavement preservation strategies. But for the National Park Service, they're a part of the Department of the Interior. And every year we have to report of how our costs are doing for different types of treatments. And this is just one thing of our decision trees of our pavement management system that we've reported out for some of our 2014 costs for crack sealing, for PCC, crack repair, surface treatment one, which we broke down for fog seals, chip seals, slurries, and et cetera. Surface two, double chip seals, cape seals, alter bonding wearing course, and our thin overlays that were inch and a half. In addition with that cost, we have to create some kind of trends, because uh, Department of Interior wants to know how these costs are going over the years for your heavier 3R projects. Where are those prices coming from? Are they going down? Are they going up? So we can allocate funding on a yearly basis appropriately and et cetera. Along with that, as I said, for our pavement management system, we use cost effectiveness. And we, this was our principal objective for managing our program. And this, for those that don't know, the cost effectiveness effectiveness evaluates the cost of strategies to deliver a separate, uh, acceptable performance. And I apologize, this uh, screen's a little bit small, but I wanted to share with you through that report that I showed, these were some of the documents that came out that gave the regions, because we had seven regions of the country that they were given these type of reports that show their conditions of their roadway. As you can see on the far left-hand side was the different route numbers, their mileage, their pavement types. We use pavement condition ratings for our numbers to, to evaluate our pavement. In addition, we talked about our prior activities, what has been done over the years, some future activities. If in 2012 and 2016, if there's gonna be any anticipated program uh, projects that are gonna be done, and through our pavement management system, we used, the, we highlighted what those areas of heavy 3R, light 3R, and pavement preservation maintenance needs were, needed to be done. As well as we also took it out 10 years. Because, you know, sometimes they may not have the funds in the first five or six years. They might want to see what's going to happen later down the road, if they can wait and hold off what that will be and et cetera. As well as then you'll see the CE scores on the far right hand side with the highest being okay for preventing a maintenance and the lowest need, they need to get in there and do some kind of rehabilitation. So with that, we also broke these down into our, our pavement condition ratings from PCRs that are 95 and above, were excellent. For our 85 to 95, we're good. For our fair, 61 to 84, and our poor is below 60. And we looked at these trends. Back in Ice-T, we established a goal. Our goal was 85 PSER. So as you can see there, we're kind of hovering almost there, but we have done a lot since 2006 to meet that. And through our pavement management and through, through our pavement preservation programs, we were able to meet, we were able to get higher, much higher than we were in 2006. In addition, with our parks, we also have to deal with parking lots. Because even though out, out west, a lot of our parks 
or have a lot of roadways to go through the Grand Canyon, et cetera, some of the parks out east are just parking lots. So we have to go out and evaluate them as well. And as you can see here, these were kind of a breakdown on mileage for poor, excellent, and good for both the roadway and also the parking lots. As well, we also created a timeline from 2016 to 2014 of the conditions of what construction work has been done since 2006 to 2014 for 4R, heavy 3R, and pavement, and pavement preservation. And as you can see, there's been a lot more pavement preservation work being done over the years. And through that, as we, we report out to the National Park Service for the seven different regions, a lot of the mount, inner mountain region and the Midwest region has done a lot of pavement preservation work. Furthermore, we do those reports, we give them to each of the regions, we also have to put in a report to the National Park Service Headquarters Office. And then they report this to uh, the Department of Interior about how, during going through each different uh, reauthorization, wants to know how their money is being used. And as you can see here, they look, we, uh, we dictate through our yearly reports of, okay, if we want to have our PCR values near that goal, what are we going to need for annual funding levels? And these are the things that we use to dictate our amounts. And as well, as you can see on the far right, where those conditions would be, say, if we only received 180 million, these are the performance measures that we're going to have out in the field. So we use these, and these are great indicators to help them along. As well, here on this slide, it shows through the different authorization bills through Congress, how our pavement condition ratings have been, and different scenarios. If we want to in improve our PCR ratings for option one with 400, 450 million, this is what our PCR values are going to be, and et cetera. And if we don't do anything at all, look what's going to happen to our roads in 2012. So good measurements, good tracking tools, and I just wanted to share that as well as here are some things, additional visual uh, things that are used for four million for good, fair, and poor as well, and et cetera. Some of the challenges, and we all have them. Uh, shifting to worst first strategy, when we first started this early in the 2000s, you know, hey, we needed to take care of those roads that were in bad shape, so we had to take care of those first. And unfortunately, like a lot of DOTs, parks tend to have too, too many requests, and we just don't have enough money as well as we wanted to quantify those benefits for our pavement preservation. Again, this goes back to that definitions and that work with the Federal Highway Division offices of uh, what are preventative maintenances, what are eligible. We wanted to make sure we come out with that definition information so all the parks are, had a clear understanding what ship seal and microsurfacing, et cetera, are. So, but we still have issues with inconsistencies as well as lack of adequate distress information because as we go out and collect this, our roadway inventory program only collects for the higher parks every three years. And some of the smaller parks are lucky to go out every five to six years. So that's a concern. And I know they're working on ways to shorten that time window as we, as through some of the other reports that we got through Larry and et cetera. Next, talking about complete and credible data. Reliable cost effectiveness analysis is is very important for the success of the national program roadway inventory. These annual condition assessments, we take those annual reports and we actually go out to the parks and we go through it. Because we might have some problems with some of the data collection of how it's being recorded. There may be some areas that they may have had a heavy, th heavy 3R, but really it's, prevent it's a preventative maintenance. And there's also some projects that may have construction done that we just didn't capture. So we use that and we go through those parks and we go through that with them, as well as on a yearly basis, they use that information to basically prioritize their construction of the next year, how that's going to be done. You need to have a robust construction history. And every year, we take all those national park roadways, we ask those parks to provide us that information, the plans and et cetera, so we can put into our pavement management system and incorporate that information talking about thicknesses, what kind of treatments were done, and et cetera, as well as you have to have a good economic records. Prior, pri project prioritization is very important. We establish those goals, and those goals are between five to 10 years worth of needs. 
All the regions, the seven regions, reviewed every two years. We provide those reports to them so they can capture that information. We also do optimization analysis. There are certain regions that only get a certain amount of money every year. So we go in and we take what they can only get and we optimize what those strategies are for them. As, a, as well as once verified by the regions, the park coordinators for each of the regions choose their prioritized projects. Some of the challenges is aligning the park project selection with the agency performance targets. It's always a challenge. And allocating the funding. All right, that's the first part I wanted to give a little bit of background of our pavement management. Next, I want to talk about a kind, of an, kind of an up and rising, and maybe it's not as up and rising as, as you know, around the country as I may put on, but another opportunity is using IDIQ contracts. And over the history for federal aid projects, basically we use the low bid process, right? And everybody loves that process, right? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, um, over the years, um, things have been changed. We have SEP 15 requirements now that able DOTs to use best value. And through the best value, you can go through using IDIQ contracts. And from what I'm going to talk about here, with this opportunity to use these experience, uh, using these IDIQ contracts, you're able to get qualified contractors to do that type of work. As well as the, you make commitments for those contractors for a three to five year period. And, and also, they don't just have one or two, three pavement preservation jobs. They may bundle it up to eight or maybe 15 in certain parts of, the, certain parts of their area. And lastly, you're able to bundle those pavement preservation jobs. Currently, in my, in my experience with uh, federal lands, we have an uh, IDIQ contract, so to speak, and it's called uh, a MATAG. It's Multiple Award Task Order Agreements, and that's what we use. And it's worked very well for us. Making sure I don't miss anything here. For those that don't know, here's kind of a little bit of definition of what IDIQ contract is. It provides for indefinite quantity of supplies and services whose performance and delivery schedule is determined by the, the amount of work orders one or more multiple contractors can use during a fixed period of time. Also known as a job order, task order, or area-wide continuing abstracts. It's uh, selected based on the lowest bid or bid factors on a given estimated scope. Furthermore, I wanted to give some examples of some other states that actually have used these, and here's one for New York State. They use this job order for culvert replacement, culvert lining, bridge joints, and et cetera. And they've felt that this experience has been very helpful for them, and they, they like this opportunity. There was an NCHRP report done, 473, that goes in a little more detail. If you want to look it up with further information, it talks about some of the DOTs across the country that have used this approach in addition to type of work for design, construction, or maintenance, and et cetera, and how often frequency they've used it. Some additional information on IDIQ contracts. Bids are based on estimated quantities. Contractors, bid unit prices, task orders are issued based on bid prices by Min Minnesota. For Delaware, they do similar to what Minnesota does, but they use multiple awards made, task orders issued based on the lowest bid for quantities. And lastly, for New York, New Jersey, and Missouri, construction task uh, catalog, contractors did the markup rates for defined tasks, job orders, and et cetera. That's a little bit of background. I know I might have rushed a little bit through there, but I, I believe I wanted to stress that, you know, there are other opportunities out there other than the low bid, and this is something that a lot of DOTs need to take advantage of. And if, if there is able ability to get some federal aid dollars, I'm sure all is up with that. One thing I wanted to mention on the MATAC program, as we go out there and do these preventative maintenance and work with those, we send out an RFP that goes out for contractors to bid through FedBiz. And as those contractors respond to that RFP, we may get five or seven people. Um, we evaluate those bids as they come in and we break them down on different uh, evaluations through our, once we get them, we rank them about, them, about how much uh, their past performance has been. Have they been doing that kind of treatment over, say, five, 10 years? We ask for that information ahead of time. 
We also look at their logistics financially. How have they been doing? Because that plays a very major role, as you all know. We also look at the, con the contractor's team qualifications to do that kind of work. As well, last but not least, their federal capabilities to do that type of work, say in New Mexico, Arizona, or whatever. We use these formulas and then we rate them accordingly and we choose one or three contractors on a period of five years and we may have maybe on the first year just doing crack sealing and then we'll go out and send out another contract to do the microsurfacing or the chip sealing, et cetera, and we're able to use those contractors to have that qualifications. All right, moving on, one of the, some of the last things I wanna talk about is everyday accounts. How many folks have heard Heard about everyday accounts? There's a few. Next week is gonna be the first summit in Baltimore. And for those that don't know, everyday accounts, basically was a uh, a, an office was established in 2012 for uh, accelerated construction, our innovation. And through that, everyday accounts started. And for those that don't know, warm mix asphalt was one of them. Leading technologies that just needed a little bit more kick in the pants to move forward to the DOTs. Warm mix asphalt was, uh, uh, safety edge was another, uh, and others. What's that? High friction. High friction surfaces, and I know later today, my companion Chris is gonna talk a little bit about that, but through this next evolution of every case counts four, pavement preservation was selected out of 11 other technologies, and with that, they wanted to look at applying pavement preservations at the right time, and that's where the win is. On the right project, that's where the where is, and with the qualified materials and construction, and that's the how. And as you can see, I've been, I'm a part of the Federal Highway Group that's looking at the win and the where, and this initiative will promote the network level approach to managing pavements that are considered the whole life cost of the assets to reduce the annual preservation costs without sacrificing performance. So what does that mean? We'll get to that in a second. A little bit further on everyday counts, like I said, we had some earlier on webinars that we went out to for the different parts of the regions of the country. We're gonna have some summits coming up here in the next few months. We're gonna hear from folks about some introduce these technologies and we're gonna get their, we're gonna get their feedback on how we're gonna go forward, and then we're gonna develop some kind of an implementation plan of how we're gonna to do to initiate some of these. And from 2017 to 2018, that's gonna be the time period of when these are gonna happen. On the when and where, they will focus on the whole life cost analysis. They will look at the network level project selection strategies, and then in addition, they're gonna look at the performance-based measures to quantify the pavement preservation benefits. The how, We'll focus on the quality of construction and the material practices of the pavement preservation treatments. As you can see on one of the slides, for like say the chip seal, and on the right hand side, the concrete, how it's being placed, what are some best practices out there, and et cetera. The construction practices as well as the materials. Moving on, there's some ability for DOTs to get some funding. So if funding has been a little bit of an issue to try to get out some of these pavement preservations. As you can see here, there are some fundings that are out there, 10 million per year for the notice of funding opportunities for the FAST Act, for the State Transportation Innovative Council, the STIC, there's up to 100,000 per STIC per year, and increased federal share for project level innovation, 5% of the total project cost. For further information, I have some websites that you can go to for further. Next, and not least, the free, the free web-based training programs that have been established with Federal Highway. Earlier yesterday, Butch talked a little bit about ISSA in collaboration with Federal Highway. I wanna say this is some great free training. Some of the obstacles is just trying to get logged in, get into the program for those who have tried to do it already, getting logged in and get your passwords. But if you use this, this website right here, um, basically, it kind of steps you through what needs to be done, so it'll be a little easier for you. But I'll tell you what, the, the, the web-based training process, the, uh, the videos, um, the closed caption on the right-hand side for those that can't, you know, have a hard time reading and kind of hearing what's being said, it's excellent. I think they did a great job with that. And as well as uh, Jerry Voigt mentioned yesterday, there's going to be some concrete ones that are going to be coming out as well. 
hopefully we're going to we're going to hope that maybe by next summer those be available as well as they're going to be also be done in Spanish for those inspectors that are out there that's going to be another great opportunity to get that information out to them as well so wanted to report a little bit back with that I'm not sure how am I doing on time you betcha But like I said, uh, you get a chance to take these. They're great if you got some inspectors, some people on the staff that may not know a little bit about chip seal or micro, excellent. I actually took the chip seal one here a few weeks ago just to check it out and I was very satisfied. They did an excellent job. And I'm not just saying that either, so. Spent a lot of time and a lot of effort with that. And like Jerry Voigt mentioned yesterday, they're really looking at innovative ways when it comes with these concrete ones that we're going to do for, um, for partial depth repair, full depth repair, dowel bar replacements, and et cetera, we're going to have those coming out as well. So be on the lookout for that. Any questions? If none, here's my contact information. Please feel free to call me if I can be of any assistance. And uh, go Broncos tonight.